Well, hey, y'all. I am so excited to be here with you this morning. Um, and thank you so much for hosting me uh, and giving me this opportunity. I cherish each and every opportunity to, to present uh, some of the things that I've learned in my, my career and some of my experience and journey. Hopefully there's some things that I'm going to talk about this morning that will be of value to you and will help you to kind of navigate um, software dev uh, in your environment. Um, so I wanted to set some expectations, a little disclaimer. I am a software developer and uh, and I've been doing this thing for a while, and I've seen a few things. If I know a thing or two, it's because I've seen a thing or two, you know, from the farmer's insurance. I bet you all have stories that you could tell as well. I'm here to share some of my experience. In doing so, I hope there's uh, some nuggets of value uh, in this presentation that you can walk away with. Um, so I used to work for a startup company called LeanKit. And it was an amazing place to work. When I joined, we had about 20 employees and we grew very fast and we had a, an awesome product around managing um, projects, around managing work using a visual Kanban board. So a lot of lean manufacturing, lean you know, principles and everything applied. Uh, and we were you know, kind of positioning ourselves as uh, thought leaders in, in the lean and agile software development space. So when I joined this company, we did well and we grew really fast. And I want to tell you um, one, of, one of the stories from that experience. We were working on this really big new feature for uh, the construction market. So one of our kind of verticals that we were targeting for our product was the construction market. And we had some time and we thought, well, you know what? While we're in here, why don't we go ahead and add this to our IT and operations kind of product as well? So we did that. And uh, that ended up taking a little bit longer time than we thought it would. And we thought, you know, while we're here, well, let's go ahead and make roll, you know, do all the development that we need to to add these features to our, our mobile apps as well. And we did. And uh, that took a little bit longer than we expected. And so you kind of see where this trend is going. And we thought, well, let's go ahead and get the marketing and sales involved and create all the collateral and training that we need to, you know, for these to roll out these new features. And we did. And that ended up taking more time than we expected. And uh, we, we were already in the process of rebranding our company uh, with new logos and, you know, new website and all that stuff. So we, we had a, a um, we thought, well, let's go ahead and add the new colors and branding and logo into our web apps and our mobile applications. And we did. And that took more time than we expected. And then we thought, well, since we got all this ready to, you know, this, all these new features, there was a big, there was a big uh, conference coming up and we thought, well, why don't we just make sure we have all this ready and make a, a big launch at this, um, at this conference for a press release and all that great stuff. And we, we worked on that and uh, yeah, again, that ended up taking longer than we expected. This whole process took a lot of coordination with a lot of teams and there were a lot of meetings involved and a lot of really long hours. In the end, we pulled it off. It was a, a big launch for our company and our product. We rolled out new versions of everything. We had new features, new mobile apps and websites and press release and we were all really excited and we celebrated everything that we had accomplished. It was pretty awesome. But after the party was over and we came to our senses, we took a step back and realized, let's never do that again. That was terrible. The, the, you know, the whole experience of, of doing all that kind of 
work and you know the the whole process and everything was was just just terrible it's not that what we did was bad we had really good really smart people doing awesome work and doing the right thing given what they knew but similar to the old saying you know a cobbler's children have no shoes as we grew in our organization, we, we were kind of naive in assuming everyone would pick up on the lean principles and practices that our product was designed for. And we kind of realized that we weren't practicing what we were preaching. We, were, we had made a lot of classic mistakes in how we were building our our product and our, our services and features at that point. What I've found and believe to be true is that people really do want to do their best work. People don't want to fail. People want an environment where they can thrive and um, see if any of these things resonate with you. I want to be proud of the work that I do and that my team does, that my organization does. I want to be proud of the quality of work, the technical you know, I want to be technically challenged and value that our, what we deliver to our customers makes their lives better. I don't want a lot of these kinds of death marches where we're just working so and, and thrashing and, 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 you know, being really frustrated with the, uh, you know, the kind of batched style of work where we're having to meet some kind of incredible deadline. I want to work somewhere that has sane working hours that respects, you know, the employees to, to work normal, <laughs> normal hours. I want uh, an environment where there's lower stress so I can spend more time with my family and people that I love and doing the things that I love to do outside of work. Work shouldn't be, you know, totally consuming everything that I do all the time. And I want to work somewhere that embraces continuous improvement, the freedom to experiment, the freedom and safety to fail and, and to try new things. And I want a place that promotes professional and personal growth. Edwards Deming, uh, there was a quote that says, most of the time when things go wrong, it's not the individuals that are at fault. It's usually the system in which these people are placed that allows or even encourages wrong behavior. I've been in software development for, for a long time, and I've been in what we you know, refer to in our industry as agile or lean software development now for more than 10 years. And if you've been involved in any of those things, you, you've probably seen a, a diagram or something that shows there's these pillars of lean where there's a, a continuous improvement and a respect for people is like the foundation for lean principles. But I've come to the conclusion that respect really is the more fundamental principle, that it's the foundation for anything and everything beyond that. Respect requires a company to empower their teams uh, to work at a sustainable pace, an environment where its employees can thrive. Uh, it kind of demands that we listen and have empathy and have mutual respect. And, and these things bring people together to fight for each other's success. It seeks to promote a healthy work environment, well-being and commitment and to reduce friction and wasteful activities. It's because we respect one another that we want to pursue things like continuous improvement and making our process better, and reducing friction and making our workflow better because we want to make the lives of our employees and our developers better. So we discovered that we needed to fix our system at Lean Kit uh, to practice what we preach and about lean and agile methodologies. We needed something that was easy to communicate, that was easy to understand, and it was easy to remember. So I want to share with you something that we came up with that um, 
has, you know, all the kind of principles of lean and agile in a packaged way that, that might be beneficial to you. What we called this was FSGD, which stands for Frequent, Small, Good, and Decoupled, which we affectionately pronounced FizzGood. FizzGood became our thinking tool for how we managed our work, how we made decisions in every team across the company, whether it's development, operations, marketing, sales, accounting, senior management, across the board. So, let's, I want to start breaking down what, what we mean by fizz good. We'll start with frequent. Frequent is the opposite of things like annually or quarterly or sporadic. And frequency is not just about speed, it's also about consistency and predictability. When you don't release frequently, it makes customers upset or frustrated. And speaking of customers, um, a customer could be any person in your value stream. It's not just the person who is, or, or the group of people who are buying your product or at the end of your value uh, delivery, but it's anyone throughout your entire system. You probably have many customers, quote, uh, along the way who deserve your respect. Your first customer is probably your own team. You don't want to do anything that, that harms or frustrates or creates friction on your own team, right? And then you, there may be other teams in your organization who are affected by your decisions and by the things that you do, the things that you create. You know, maybe there's someone on this other team that you would rather not upset because they're they're kind of grumpy and intimidating. And then, you know, there may be other downstream customers in your organization who are affected by your decisions. And they could be, you know, operations or support or even marketing or sales, customer success, any of those kinds of things. So releasing frequently uh, allows us to do a lot of things. Uh, one is to get you know, f feedback more often so that we know we're, are we building the right thing or not? Are we in making improvements to our product in the right direction? Uh, to get that feedback earlier than later, you know, helps us to make sure we're not going down the wrong path for very long. It also, that feedback helps us to manage the priority of our work. You know, something that we were doing, um, you know, for several weeks or, or months, we may realize that based on feedback, hey, we need to shift gears. You, uh, when you start a project, you have a hypothesis in mind of, you know, what it means to be, um, you know, for this project to be complete or what this project should look like at the end. But delivering more frequently, you may realize some way, part way through your original scope that you're, you're kind of done. You've delivered sufficient un, un, enough value to your customer that you can move on and focus on other things that may now be of higher priority. S something always comes up, right, that you weren't planning on before, and by releasing frequently and predictably, you can more easily shift gears. That's why, you know, agile is called more agile, because you can move around and, uh, and go different directions if you need to. Releasing frequently also creates this awesome byproduct of trust. It gives your customers confidence that essentially training them to expect that new and better things are coming all the time. And customers can then become very forgiving when things don't work quite right because they trust that you are going to quickly fix those things and, and make the product right. You know, they can, they can forgive some of the missing features or annoyances in the, in, the, in the product because they know and trust that you're going to resolve those uh, as, as soon as possible. A confidence and trust that you will eventually get it right. 
More companies are releasing more frequently, even, you know, companies like Microsoft. Microsoft used to release a new version about every three years, whether they needed to or not. And some of these products um, are now on a monthly delivery and weekly hotfix. And it kind of am amazes me to think about how, how did a company like Microsoft shift from, you know, year-long cycles to um, releasing as frequently as they do? How did they turn a ship that big? And, and it's enabled them to do amazing things like raise our hopes that they will be relevant. <laughs> so frequent. Frequent can't happen without things being small. And of course, the opposite of small is big. So imagine a highway full of big tractor trailers. They're slow to start, they're slow to stop, and what happens if you have a highway at 100% at, at utilization of tractor trailers? It's a parking lot because, you know, nothing can get done. But you compare that to something like a motorcycle that, you know, a motorcycle can't carry as much, right? But that's kind of the point. It is the epitome of agile. It starts fast, it goes fast, it can stop fast, it can easily dodge obstacles and zip around the big slow moving behemoths. And this is related to uh, queuing theory. You, you all remember your queuing theory from, from college, right? No, <clears throat> it's because math, it, it, things need to, Things absolutely need to be small and to have slack in your system. It's true for fluid dynamics, it's true for electrical systems, it's true for traffic management, and it's true for any sequential system, including project management, software development. You might be thinking, well, aren't things just, some things just are big, right? They're, they're naturally big. There's things like architecture and design. And I submit to you that there are some things that are notoriously big, but they don't necessarily have to be. There are, uh, you know, other tools. My experience is um, if we start to peel back the onion, we can find creative ways to break things down into smaller bite-sized chunks. If you've heard of this, this uh, method called the five whys, it's a technique for exploring a problem until you arrive at the real underlying issue or, you know, the the fundamental problem that you may be facing. For example, you may have like, oh, why is this, why is this so big? You know, how can we make this smaller? Because there's a lot of moving parts. Well, why are there so many parts? Because there's a lot of dependencies th between these, uh, these systems. Why can't we break some of these dependencies so that we can, um, you know, move these things quickly independently of one another? Well, because deployment is such an expensive thing to do. Well, why is it so expensive? Because we don't have the automation and, and tests and things that we need to ensure that, you know, we're building and shipping the right thing. Well, why don't we have automations and tests for this? Because we have this terrible system that we've developed over the years that is, uh, maybe you have also experienced some handcrafted locally sourced uh, operations. And, but continuing to dig deeper and challenge your assumptions can lead to the discovery of underlying systematic issues that are creating constraints on your work. So what do you do if something turns out to be bigger than you estimated? If Breaking it down is an, isn't immediately apparent. Put it back on the queue and or into your holding area or whatever and get back to the flow of smaller tasks. And similar to like sleeping on it, let the problem simmer for a while. A creative solution might just come to you later on. The idea is to keep moving forward and keep... Uh, Keep things small and keep so that you can be more frequent. Now let's talk about good. Well, obviously the the opposite of good is garbage. We don't want to 
get bogged down. You know, we don't want to be building things that, that are terrible quality and terrible, you know, in our delivery. But we also don't want to uh, get bogged down in trying to over-engineer, you know, the things that we're building. Um, perfection is the enemy of progress, right? We, uh, I don't know if you have the same kind of term in your, your community, but like gold plating, like engineers spending way too much time trying to come up with the perfect solution that is, you know, kind of, kind of wasteful because, you know, it, there's, a, there's a simpler way to just get the job done. Reed Hoffman, who is one of the founders of LinkedIn, has this great quote. If you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. So, the, um, you know, there's a, like a definition of what is good enough? What is, what is something that solves the problem that we can, we can get out the door more quickly so that we can get um, that feedback sooner than later and, and make improvements? To give you an example, anyone here have the very first iPhone? A couple of you? I think I didn't. My first iPhone is like, well, like uh, the 3G phone, I think. But I think this is really interesting. The very, you know, what we consider today to be like table stakes for a, a, uh, a modern smart device, smartphone, you know, like the features we expect a smartphone to have, right? Um, but the very first iPhone, and this was, you know, game-changing for the industry, it did not have things like a keyboard and stylus, which, you know, at that time was revolutionary because everybody was using Blackberries or, tri you know, trios or something like that. Um, but it also did not have messaging or multimedia messaging. It did not have GPS, so you couldn't figure out where you were going or anything like that. It did not have 3G, so it was really slow. Uh, there was no SDK for the first iPhone, which meant the only apps that you had were the ones that came on the phone. There was no app store. There was no way to create new apps or to get new apps on the phone. There was not even things like cut, copy, and paste. Man, that seems like a, you know, in, in today's terms, like that seems like a pretty useless device, <laughs> right? But they, they launched knowing that some of these things weren't ideal, that, you know, they had plans for these things, but they launched so that they could take advantage of the market and get the feedback and, you know, the rest is history. So finding the balance between what's good enough and that gold plating, um, every team has to kind of come up with their own definition of what it means to be good or good enough. At my organization, we came up with a, in product development, uh, our own acronym to help our software teams define what is good enough. We repurposed TLDR, which on the internet, you may know, means too long didn't read, which, you know, pretty appropriate for people who don't have a lot of attention span. Um, but for us, TLDR stands for tested, logged, documented, and reviewed. So tested means that every feature has sane tests, you know, good enough tests that describe the behavior, and every bug fix includes tests that guard against regression of that bug. And logged means that we're not only logging uh, debug messages about what's going on in the application, but we, we you know, we're convinced, and uh, I believe that it's absolutely important for you to understand behavior as well as, you know, just what the application is doing. So logging what, what, how the system behaves, how the users are using the product so that you can understand the context of when something goes wrong. We've had in our in software development in, industry kind of like this standard for what does it mean to uh, how do we measure success in uh, the software that we create. And it's usually been like how we deliver 
uh, new features and new software. But I submit to you that it's, it's not just the delivery of software. It's, it's critically important that we measure the usage of that software to know what features are being used and how, when and how often they're being used and common usage patterns. You can't make good decisions without real data on how your, your systems are being used. And then there's the dreaded documentation, right? Everybody loves to write documentation. But in this case, we're talking about not volumes of documentation that no one's going to read. We're talking about practical documentation like how, a, a wiki or a readme on, on how to build and test uh, the product, how to set it up, how to, you know, what are some configuration options and examples. Uh, if you have an API, what are the usage examples of that? So this is going to help your team and even your future self. You know, if you, I don't know about you, but I clear the screen every night. So something I created today, if I have to re-encounter it uh, six weeks or six months from now, I was like, who wrote this crap? Oh, that was me. So, you know, practical documentation on how to configure and how to set it up is going to be, you know, good for, for you and everyone. And then last, review. Uh, we used, um, as I I'm, I'm, understand a lot of you do too, Git and like pull requests against feature and bug branches. We had a strict no self merge policy. Uh, code must be checked out and reviewed by someone else. Sometimes we would, um, you know, end the week with uh, what we call PR parties where we would review pull requests together as a team. And this helped promote, um, you know, a lot of things uh, in, our, in our team. But if a, P, if a pull request does not satisfy the the TLDR like the test coverage uh, or the logging or developed it's you know regardless of how well done the 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 code was itself then that PR gets rejected and those things get fixed so that we know we satisfy our entire TLDR so why did we do things like review uh, review our code it helped with mentoring it helped with cross training helped with team building and sometimes it actually helped us to find bugs before they got any further along in the process. Um, and this is, you know, an opportunity for, you know, some of your teammates to heckle others like, well, what did you do that for, you know? Legacy code. We, believe, we believed in kind of the scout rule, you know, to leave it better than you found it. And in this case, TLDR might be a little bit looser. But uh, try to, you know, apply TLDR in the most practical way fashion. So if you see dead code or, or you know, have things that, that no longer, are no longer needed, clean it up. Leave it, leave it better than you found it. And then last, we've got frequent, small, good, and decoupled. And decoupled is, is like the opposite of something that's very coordinated, requiring a lot of time and of more than one team at, at one time that leads to, you know, lots of meetings, friction, and delays. Now, I know that not all meetings can be eliminated, not all coordination can be eliminated, but this is like, how can we make sure that what we're doing is as independent and decoupled from other parts of the organization as possible so that we reduce the friction and delay of, you know, some of these, these things. And there's also this idea of damaging. Uh, your work should not adversely impact the work of other teams. It's this idea of do no, do no harm. Anybody remember this? The launch of Windows 95? You know, it was a pretty big deal back in the day. You know, they had, uh, you know, celebrities. They had the Rolling Stones song, Start Me Up. Uh, look at this guy, you know. Don't, don't you know that he just wrote a big fat check for two copies of Windows 95, and he can't wait to get home and tell his buddies on CompuServe. <laughs> so this... This old 
Microsoft model of delivering software is the, uh, the epitome of highly coordinated, highly coupled work. So how long did it take from the last line of code that was written until the launch of Windows 95? And this guy is holding a box of Windows 95 in, in his hands. It's kind of, kind of astounding. I think, I think I did figure this up one time. I think it was maybe eight months between the last line of code written for Windows 95 and when it was in the stores. So in our software systems, we tend to focus on the individuals who are doing the work. But in a relay race, you can have the absolute fastest runners, but it doesn't matter how well, you know, how fast your runners can run if the handoffs are, don't work, right? If you mess up a handoff, you're going to lose the race. So our problems and delays in delivering software are usually in the handoffs. Our goal should be to focus on the baton and not the runners. How can we reduce the friction of handoffs or eliminate as many handoffs as possible? So some practical applications of, of how we would think about FizzGood in our organization. So some of the things that we did as a result of thinking in this way was one, we would, uh, any new feature we would introduce into our products, we would put those features behind a fe what we call a feature flag. Uh, that's become a, a kind of a common thing now, but uh, it's a easy way to turn those new features on and off. And sometimes we would ship software that had those features built in that were just turned off by default. And maybe we would pilot that new feature with a select group of customers as an experiment to get feedback from them before we rolled it out to uh, all of our customers. And um, that's what we would call by, by shipping dark. We would, we would ship those new features, but they wouldn't be turned on until later. Um, and sometimes when we found bottlenecks in our process, we would analyze and we, so we could fix those systematic issues. We, had, uh, we gave our teams discretionary budget that we called bucks for speed. Each team was, you know, if they saw a way that they could, you know, not just build a solution, but uh, purchase, you know, a solution that would, would help them to go faster um, that, or remove technical debt. Um, anything and everything that would improve the efficiency of the team. We would also, um, FizzGood became part of our vocabulary. When big problems, you know, came around, we would say, how can we, how can we FizzGood this? For this does not FizzGood. How, how can we approach this so that we do no harm to ourselves or, or to our customers? If you travel to Nashville, uh, which is where I used to live, and you drive down I-65 towards Franklin, Tennessee, you'll see a huge radio tower um, on the, from the interstate. In 1925, the Grand Ole Opry began its broadcast. And traditional antenna construction back then was, was very expensive. Uh, if you wanted to build a big tower, you had to build a big base, and you could kind of think of it as like building an Eiffel Tower. It, it, there was a lot of steel, required a lot of money, things a bunch of farmers in Middle Tennessee didn't have. And what they come in, came up with is called the Blaw Knox Tower. It was built and finished in 1932, 878 feet was the tallest uh, antenna in North America, and it's an engineering marvel. The small base can pivot. There are just a few guide wires that hold it up. There's a minimal amount of steel. It's easy to maintain. They can even take the entire tower, lay it down on the ground, do maintenance, and, and raise it back up again. The signal can be picked up from Evansville, Indiana, all the way down to Huntsville, Alabama. It's got a you know, huge range. 
And the more, you know, a lot of us that worked at the company at the time, we drove by this tower every day. And the more we thought about it, um, we felt like this, this was a great analogy to our fizz good approach. Frequency, um, frequent, small, good, and decoupled, they're all great, but they aren't equally important to every organization. For us, frequency was the most important. Frequency is what kept our customers tuning in day after day, uh, week after week, for all the reasons that I've, I've told you about before. You know, they were always expecting us to come out with new features and improvements to our product. Keeping things small and good allow us to achieve that frequency. And then those small good decisions are grounded between marketability and developer sustainability. So decoupled is the foundation that keeps, it keeps you flexible and allows you to achieve what you do without a lot of coordination or getting bogged down in a rigid process. So in your case, frequency may not be the highest priority. If you make, um, like if an organization makes medical equipment that, that people's lives depend on, good is probably the most important focus you should have. Or as an organization, maybe you need to focus on a particular area for a while, such as making things small or decoupled. And in the process, you will achieve the, the other benefits or facets, uh, you know, just by consequence. Kanban um, and FizzGood are very complementary process tools. In a nutshell, Kanban is made up of four principles. One is to visualize your work. And this step alone can be uh, very eye-opening for your team and your organization. Uh, it's very important that your board that you're developing uh, it accurately reflects the work and the process that you do. A lot of times people like to, you know, when they first set up a Kanban board, try to idealize, well, in, the, in, the, in an ideal situation, this is how our workflow should, should be. Like, don't do it that way because that's not how you really work. You need to visualize your, your work uh, exactly the way it works today so that you can start to identify what the pain points are in your process. Uh, the next principle is to limit work and process so that you're, that no one, te no team is taking on too much work at once. And it's kind of counterintuitive, but, but by limiting the focus of the work that you have that's going on at any given time, it helps to improve your efficiency and help you deliver more frequently and uh, with higher quality overall. Once you've uh, experimented with some of those things, then you can really start to understand the, the next principle, which is the flow of work for you to be able to spot any bottlenecks and systematic issues. Where are things backing up? Where are things uh, having, you know, taking longer to move from one step to the next? And what are the issues that are causing that, that friction? And then you can start running incremental changes and experiments and measuring those to make sure, you know, to see if they are making a positive impact on your workflow or not. And by using all that information, you can, over time, you can get, you start to pursue continuous improvements to your process. Okay, so what is the most important question that, you know, your boss comes to you and asks you, fill in the blank. When's it going to be done? Right? So you go back to your, your desk and you, you bring out your trusted tool for managing your, uh, your expectations like Magic 8 Ball, you know. Uh, when are we going to get this project done? Oh, right. So I'll just grab a number out of my rear end and add 20% and, and we're good. I've got a number and I'll, I'll give that. So magic eight ball, are we gonna finish this project on time? N um, maybe not. 
The goal is as you start to move and make incremental improvements to your process and make tasks smaller and deliver more frequently, you reduce those dependencies, your work becomes much easier to measure and predict. That's the goal. Let's talk about multitasking. Our culture seems to be fixated on multitasking. We put it in our job descriptions, must be a good multitasker, right? We put it on our resumes, best multitasker ever, right? The truth is none of us are very good at multitasking, no matter how hard we try to convince ourselves. Kids love going to a circus. Big kids, you know, us grown-ups, we, we don't mind it so much either. It's exciting to see the, the lion tamer get into the cage with the lion and convince the lion not to maul him to death. Now, the whip is cool, right? But it turns out the whip does nothing for the lion. The whip is for the audience. The audience thinks, hey, Indiana Jones, this guy's really cool. Um, but what's up with the chair? Lions have incredible powers of focus. That's what helps them to survive in the wild. And when you put the four legs of a chair in a lion's face, the lion can't decide which of the four legs to focus on uh, to, like, you know, deal with this issue that's going on here. Um, the lion essentially becomes paralyzed with indecision. We are much the same way. When we have too many tasks on our plate, our brains become overloaded. We think we can switch from one task to another, uh, but our brains don't work that way. We, we can't stop thinking about those other problems, either consciously or subconsciously. They even haunt us in our sleep. Uh, how many times have you woke up with a revelation on a problem? Like, aha, I know how to fix that. Our subconscious doesn't stop thinking. And so it may sound counterintuitive, but do everything in your power to limit the work you do to one thing at a time. And I guarantee uh, I've, I've seen how this plays out on multiple teams and different organizations. You will get more work done. You will get it done faster and at higher quality than trying to juggle too many things at once. Another thing that I want to share with you is uh, a meeting technique that we learned uh, at, you know, around the same time that we were adopting FizzGood in our organization. And uh, this is a, a pretty simple um, technique, and I've used this with great success at every organization I've been in, involved in in the last 10 years and also use this to in workshops and conferences and training. This is an amazing way to conduct meetings and it's called Lean Coffee. Lean Coffee was, was born out of the um, agile, lean um, Kanban movement. Uh, one of the kind of thought leaders in the movement had a user group in Seattle and they would meet over breakfast and they called this lean coffee because it was a way for them to uh, do discussions um, more efficiently and effectively. So what you need are some sticky notes, some markers, a simple Kanban board uh, that could be just an easel or a, a blank wall where you're meeting or a, an electronic uh, board, a timer which can be something like a kitchen timer or a timer on your phone. And it also helps to have a good attitude because, hey, we're, we're discussing, we're going to do, we're going to work on these things together. When, so when everyone gets together, the first thing you're going to do is write down some ideas of what you want to discuss onto your sticky notes. And then after that, you're going to uh, quickly pitch your uh, ideas for topics so that everyone understands uh, what, what you're representing. Everyone gets two votes. You can use those votes however you wish. You can vote uh, on your own topics or someone else's topics. You can vote one 
on two different topics, or you can use both votes on, on one topic. And then finally, after all the votes are tallied, you can sort your uh, topics by the most votes. Then you start your discussion. You set a timer for five minutes, you pick the, the top voted discussion item, and you start talking. Sometimes uh, your discussion in, generates ideas and action items that you need to do. When the timer goes off, everyone is respectful of the time and stops talking and everyone gets a chance to vote. Do we stay on this topic for another five minutes or do we move on to the next topic? And in doing so, this is a very democratic way of running a meeting and helps to create a sense of urgency to discussing the different topics so that you can get through as much information in a meeting as possible. You've probably experienced a meeting where you have some couple of, you know, one or two people who are like really loud, who have really strong opinions and who will dominate a meeting to talk about what is most important to them, right? So this is a way to prevent that kind of friction and frustration in the meetings. Um, I've seen how effective this is in helping teams to really uh, be effective in talking about the things that are most important to the team and not most important to that one or two individuals. You can also run uh, lean coffee using remote meetings. You can use a physical board if possible, you know, with, with someone managing that board, or you can use a, a virtual board or, you know, Kanban software or even a online spreadsheet like Google Sheets. And, uh, you know, it might require getting creative with how you tally up votes and, and things like that, but uh, I, I've done lots of lean coffees remotely as well. You can also run lean coffees at scale. It's, it's better if the discussion size is kept, you know, six to eight people. So if you have a big event or a company-wide meeting or, a, you know, a whole part of your organization that wants to brainstorm on something, then you can uh, break up into smaller groups, run lean coffee at each table, and then come back together at the end and share what the key takeaways were from each of the the teams. Whoa, what just happened? Went fast. Yeah, that's... Wow, I guess, uh, I guess I'm not talking about that part of my presentation. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I want to come back to this fundamental principle of respect. I believe that... Um, that is the key ingredient to any significant change, process improvement, or success for your team and organization. If you have respect at, at the foundation of your team and your organization, the core of what you're doing, then you, your team, your organization is going to be motivated to make decisions to improve your process. The other part of, that I was going to tell you about is I, I've made a lot of mistakes in my career as a software developer. Um, and I, I'm happy to, sh well, yeah, I'm happy to share with you some of those mistakes right now. Um, I, there were times in my career where I didn't ask for help. There were times in my career when I didn't follow through on a promise that I had made. Um, I'm developing software and I uh, avoided conflict with my teammates or I failed to take responsibility for something that either I did wrong or I saw that was broken in our system or our process. And there were also times when I saw achievements uh, by other individuals in my team or organization and I didn't, I didn't let them know, I didn't celebrate those achievements. So looking back over my career, the biggest mistakes I made had nothing to do with software development. It was, it was how I viewed myself, how I viewed other people, and how I 
responded or treated them. Um, and that's why I, I say that respect um, is kind of a, a fundamental thing that we need to have in our organizations and, and try to uh, promote on our teams is so that we can avoid some of those kinds of pain points and friction. The truth is, every one of us wants to know that the things we do matter, that our work has value and significance, that we have value. How can you show someone that you work with how much you value them and their work? So all the things that we've talked about, you know, you may be thinking in your, in your head like, wow, I wish, you know, I wish we could make some of those kinds of improvements at our workplace. That, that, that won't be easy or like that seems like impossible for us to change things that we do. Um, some things are hard and you, and you, you know, you wish you could just jump into a time machine and, and avoid some of the, the hard work that you have to do. You just want to fast forward until that, that ideal place where you've, you know, everything's better. Uh, but there's no shortcut to success. Uh, there's no single cure. Improving and transforming your process takes time and hard work. Um, it takes people who will champion and not give up because things will be difficult. At the end of the day, what's most important is we get, you know, our work across the finish line and to make sure that we're getting the right things across the finish line. It doesn't matter how fast you ship the wrong things, right? So we want to release frequently. We want to do all the things that are that are good in our organization, but we want to make sure that we're, we're doing the right work. So my hope is that in talking about frequent, small, good, and decoupled, and fizz good, that it's got you thinking about ways that you can improve your process, maybe some steps that you could take, uh, you know, in the near future or things that you can talk about with your team or your leadership. Um, I want your work to fizz good too. Last but not least, regardless of the work that you do, I believe that you have an incredible opportunity to impact people's lives through the power of technology. To 99% of the world, the things that we do as software developers and working with tech and, and computers is, is like magic, right? Um, I hope you take the talents that you have, the things that you're doing, and um, the things that you're learning, and you get out there and you make a positive impact on your workplace, your community, and the world. Get out there and be awesome. Thank you. <laughs>